Hello everybody, welcome back to Find My Paths From Home. Thank you so much for joining us today for this special pre-recorded session. My name is Ellie, I'm Senior Community Executive for Find My Past, and luckily I'm not alone today in today's task. We're going to be looking at Find My Past's incredible collection of military records and I'm joined today by Find My Past military expert Paul Nixon. How are you Paul? Very well Ellie, thank you. Very, very pleased to be talking about military records at this important time of year for everybody. Well, exactly. You know, Remembrance is, is just around the corner by the time we are recording this and also by the time it comes out as well. So I think it's a good it's going to be a good refresher for anybody who has looked at our military records before. But also it's going to be good for anybody coming to Farmer Pass past for the first time, looking to find the story of their military ancestor. And hopefully together we will be able to point them in the right direction. So. Let's get started, shall we? Um, so I think one of the first things I wanted to touch on with you, Paul, if that's OK, mm. is the fact that a lot of us probably do have a military ancestor and we may not even know it. For example, my grandfather, my paternal grandfather, I never knew until about 18 months ago that he fought during the Second World War and he was part of Monty's Eighth Army. I just... I couldn't believe that. I, that was just incredible for me to find. Yeah, we're very lucky, really, that we that we haven't been. Was well, as, as a First World War veteran wrote to me once. His name was George Coppard, and he wrote a, a very well known book called uh, "With a Machine Gun to Cambrai." And uh, and I wrote to him uh, saying how much I'd enjoyed the book. And he he wrote back to me and said, "Yeah, I'm glad you've enjoyed it, and uh, and I'm glad. Uh, you know, I hope you will never be compelled to go to war." And I was I was 18 at the time. That was a bit about 1980. Um, and we are very lucky that um, my generation and, and generations, you know, that have come since have not been compelled to go to war uh, in in a world war. But for me, uh, as with you, Ellie, my my grandfather and and his four brothers uh, all served in the First World War, um, and I had relatives who served in the Second World War as well. And in fact, I was researching somebody the other day. Uh, she her husband was killed in the First World War, and uh, her her only son was killed in the Second World War. So Gosh. there you go. Sad, sad stories. So we, we are, of course, we've had uh, the Gulf conflicts and other other conflicts. We've had Northern Ireland, you know, there's there's never seems to be peace uh, at one time, does there, anywhere. But but we've been spared, touch wood, uh, a world war. Yes, absolutely. And the thing is, there are stories there to be found and that there are people that may indeed have been forgotten. I don't know if any of you watching this have ever looked up at your local war memorial for example and you know pondered at the names listed there how many of them have got people to remember them today it's just yeah. incredible so paul i have my first question for you then for anybody watching today i come to you and i say that i believe that i have an ancestor who fought in say the first world war or the second world war or even you know conflicts beyond that where would you advise that i start well, I think um, with all research, um, the, the first thing to do is to uh, look at what's what the family might have. Look at letters. Look at um, look at stories. Talk to people. Um, uh, talk to older members of the family uh, to see if they know about this particular individual. So, so do that homework first because you might find that you've got things that relate to to that ancestor's service in in a particular conflict. There might be medals. Um, if they're First World War medals or earlier, there'll be uh, the person's name inscribed around the edges, or impressed is the correct term actually, rather than inscribed. Um, Second World War medals weren't named, but there might be other medals with them that do have names. Um, so look look first of all to see if you have. Um, artifacts, ephemera, medals, uh, letters, postcards, photos. Um, and then after that, uh, I, well, I, I, th I actually think these days just doing a, a Google search, to be honest, is, is a good enough tip, you know, and particularly if, as with all family history, the, the more unusual the name, you're blessed with a very unusual name, Ellie, actually, aren't you? Um. So it's, a, it's, a, it's an easily researchable name. Um, uh, I can only imagine how that name came about in your family, how, what, what caused that name to evolved but anyway um but yes having having an unusual name is, is always helpful um so so do the google search you might be surprised to find uh, information about your ancestor on a an auction site on a news site um and then once you've done the basic background go to find my past um and, and 
do a broad military search or, or do, do a search across all the records and then and then look at, at military records as well because if you if you'll find the person in military records they'll almost certainly be in census records um birth marriage and death records plus potentially school records so so they they probably appear in multiple sources on find my past so don't just restrict your search to military put military within the wider context of that person's life I think that's a really, really valid point. And it takes me nicely on to my next slide. Uh, remember, your ancestor's story will play out in other records too. The, you know, their experiences during wartime is not the be all and end all of their story. Um, they would have had a family. They would have probably, probably gone to school. They may have got married. They may have had a family. There's so much more to explore. But in terms of how to find the military records, there's actually two straightforward ways to go and find them on Find My Past. And these are just two of them. I don't know whether you'd like to touch on them, Paul. Yeah, um, well, I I generally would go to, if I was, uh, I, I buy medals, I buy photos, I buy all sorts of things. And when, and when I do that, I looking for the military records, I go straight to the military record search and type in the person's name um, and number, usually. Um, I also use a wildcard quite a lot, actually. I don't know. Um, I, I always think it's incredibly useful. Um, and, uh, and I don't think it harms to keep reminding people about the wildcard. So if you're not sure of a man's number, or let's say you found a record for, for a man, uh, but the last two digits of the regimental number are obscured. So it might be his number is 12345. Um, and, and you can only see the number one, two, three, uh, or one, two, for instance. Uh, you, you type in uh, one, two, um, wildcard which is the asterisk the star uh, and it will bring up all records that begin with the number one two and you could do the same for for a name so for instance ellie your name overthrow you could you could just type it over and then an asterisk after the r and it will bring up all the combinations of names uh, that that have letters after the word over so i think um using the wildcard is is very useful um it can also save you time, for that matter. If you if you've got an ancestor who served in the Argyle and Sutherland Highlanders, there are a number of ways to write that regiment name. You could write it with Argyle and the, the A and D, or you could write it Argyle ampersand, and then then various abbreviations H L D R S for Highlanders or the full word. So there are there are many ways that that regiment regimental name can be expressed. And if you typed in one version of that name, you'd be excluding other versions that find my past as transcribed. So I would always say for Argyle and Southern Highlanders, you just type in asterisk ARG asterisk. And that brings up everything that you could possibly wish for. I guess unless somebody's just transcribed it as ANSH for, for the regiment, but 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 it will it will bring up um, the vast majority of the records. So so do use the wild card and you can use the asterisk before before words, after words, in the middle of words, in the middle of numbers, there's no limit. Um, there's no restriction on the number of characters that you have to type in. Um, I just find it incredibly useful. Um, so, so yes, I I would always go to the military records if I'm first of all starting out on my exploration of a particular soldier. If I'm sure that um, uh, I want to look at medal cards, medal index cards, for instance, medal records. I'd just go to the, I'd start typing medal in the all, all record search because that that's the way to hone in and look at particular record sets. And you will find as well that if you do searches on a specific record set, the results that appear are different to the results that would appear if you just did a search on all military records, for instance. You get you get different details. So so do bear that in mind as well. Absolutely. And what's quite powerful now about the All Records uh, page is in the search box, if you, for example, type in military or army, you will get all corresponding record collections for that keyword. So if you do want to go and have, we'll touch on this a little bit later on, but if you want to go and see the incredible collection of military records that we've, uh, we've established over the years, that's the way to go and do it. Um, and in particular, then, if you want to go and search that, you know, a record set as opposed to all military records, that is how you can do that. I think I think you can, uh, if you typed in Navy, you'd also get records which uh, had the word naval, wouldn't you, as exactly, well? Exactly, yes. Yeah. Lovely. Now, what I thought might be quite good fun, Paul, is because obviously you you are a, you're an expert in your field in, in military history and military family history. I thought what might be quite nice is if you could touch upon your your favourite military record sets and why you think 
people should maybe go and take a look at them to find their ancestors. And I thought we would start with the British Army service records. Yeah, it's a good place to start, Ellie. And um, I remember when I was living in India at the time, um, and Find My Past started publishing the records in, uh, it was branded at the time as Chelsea Pensioners because it was uh, th these records in W97 and W96 and records held by the National Archives. And and I was extremely interested to see these coming because they're essential if your ancestors served in the British Army before the First World War, because these are, met, these are records for men who were uh, sometimes discharged to pension. Um, there, there are records from a number of series. Um, they, they're incomplete, uh, like most um, records, British military records that survive. They're, they're incomplete. Um, records were weeded. Uh, if a soldier was killed on active service or died on active service, his record wouldn't have survived. It would have been taken out. Um, even for those men who do survive, uh, records have been have been weeded because there was no thought of at all of course for future historians and genealogists so what you do find in in these uh, service records pre-first world war are mainly attestation papers and, and and sometimes medical papers but but nevertheless um they're extremely important important it's an extremely rich collection and then added to that you have um all the first world war records as well w363 and w364 so 363 are the burnt documents uh, so called because they were records that were stored in the warehouse in Arnside street which was bombed in the second world war and many many were destroyed and, and many were badly damaged so they're called the burnt documents but the documents in w364 uh, are the pension documents and they were stored elsewhere and weren't damaged so if you're lucky you'll find records in both series um but for the most part um we reckon that around 60% of records were destroyed in, in the bombing in the Second World War. And so the chances are uh, that you won't find your ancestors' record. But but Find My Past has indexed far more of the records in W363 than our competitors, for instance, because you will find uh, in within the records in W363 lists of men, which somehow seem to have appeared within other service records. So you can be going through, let's say, your ancestors' service record, and you suddenly, suddenly come across a page lists of men which might be from uh, a casualty clearing station or might be from uh, part two orders from a particular regiment and your ancestors name might not even be on that list but it is nevertheless a list of a list of names of, of soldiers and find my past uh, transcribed all those names and we're the only company to have done so and that has added um, a further 300,000 names to our collection uh, which makes it the most comprehensive collection out there so so those records are are essential there's um there are no more records from the first world war or earlier that are still to be digitized or um, they're, they're all available out there there are no records being held back by the national archives apart from officer service records which you'd have to go to the national archives to look at um, and the reason those have haven't been digitized is that um they contain um medical information uh, next of kin information some of it going into the 1920s or, or later than that for that matter so those haven't been digitized but you can search them on find my past you'll you can search the officer's name um, those records are in w339 and w374 um, and you can search the officer's name search for his uh, regiment and um, you'll see if a record survives and if it does survive you then take that forward to the national archives and uh, go in there armed with a phone or a camera and take photos these records are incredible, and I know we've got quite a lot more to get through. But um, and I will talk about this a little bit later on. But one of my one of my major tips for looking at these records is that don't just look at if you open up the image, don't just look at that one image because chances are there are pages and pages and pages for you to explore, and the extra detail you can get from these is incredible. So yes, um, number two. So, uh, yes, metal index cards. Um, again, this uh, collection is on Find My Past thanks to our partnership with the National Archives. Um, we provide uh, an index of the cards and you can then link through and, uh, and view the image at the National Archives website. But for every person who served overseas in the First World War um, or who served in a theatre of war, um, or even not a theatre of war, somewhere like India, for instance, there was a medal entitlement. And that medal entitlement was recorded on a medal index card. And those medal index cards then point to medal roles. But the, so the index card is useful if your ancestor served overseas um, in the First World War. It also includes uh, Silver War badge cards as well. Um, I think 
the collection is around uh, well over six million men served. Um, I'm not sure offhand how many cards there are, but you can find out pretty easily on Find My Past. But but if your ancestor served overseas and, and earned medals, he or she will have a medal in the next card. So that's why that's so important. Um, if your ancestor served on the home front, uh, let's say uh, he joined up or she joined up, but never ever, never served overseas, there won't be medal index card because there weren't there wouldn't have been medals awarded um so so that is a that, that is a gap and that's why this this collection the collection of uh, records for people who served in the first world war is incomplete because you you may you may have someone who's who served at home um who had a record a service record which was destroyed in the second world war so served at home no medals no service record to all intents and purposes didn't serve but but of course they did serve so um but yes, that's that's why the medal cards are, are so important. And typically information on there, uh, you'll find for men who served overseas before 1916, you'll find the date of uh, arrival overseas. You'll see their medal entitlement. You'll see details of regiments served with overseas. It won't include details of regiments served within the UK prior to um, embarkation. But it will will give you information about service overseas, sometimes details about um, a man being killed or dying of wounds or promotions, etc. So a lot of information, very, very core information that is is necessary. I completely agree. Um, Paul has actually been helping me with some research for a blog that's going to be published shortly uh, in line with um, Remembrance. And for one of the people I was researching, I couldn't find a surviving um, service record for them but I did find them in the medal index cards and it gives me this particular person's enlistment date. And that confirms that he was only about, I think he was about 17 when he enlisted. And other than that, I would not have, were it not for this record set, I would not have that key bit of information. Yeah. It's incredible how many men did enlist under age actually. I'm just reading uh, coincidentally um, Richard Van Emden's, Boy Soldiers of the Great War, which a new edition has just been published, and, I, and it just dropped in on my doormat the other day. Well, we probably went through the doormat. It's such a big book. Um, but um, it, yeah, it's incredible the number of men who did serve who were underage. If you look at the um, look at their ages by the time they, they finished the war, um, it, it shows often that they enlisted as 15, 16 year olds. Amazing. Let's talk about Scots Guards. Scots Guards, yes. Um, well, this one and the next one, I think. Um, so Scots Guards and Coldstream Guards, uh, we publish oh, both those records, um, both unique to Find My Past, um, both both those collections, um, in partnership with the, with the Guards regiments um, at Wellington Barracks, and we're delighted to do so. So those records go back to the 1800s um, and up to the Second World War. For, for the Coldstream Guards, they include record they include records up to uh, including the First uh, Second World War. Scots Guards it finishes around 1938. Um, we don't publish um, records beyond that time um, due to confidentiality reasons. But for the Scots Guards, we publish um, attestation papers, uh, service records. The Coldstreams had given their records to the MOD. So the records we publish for the cold streams are uh, enlistment registers um, and, and metal rolls, etc. But but nevertheless, um, great records um, digitized uh, by Find My Past at our Boston Spa studio um, and contains information in, in those collections that you won't find in W0363 and W0364. Um, so in, within some of those files, for instance, you'll find photos, you'll find pay books, you'll find letters. Uh, it's, it's fascinating stuff. There's just so much to find, isn't there? Mm. Um, and the last one I've got for you is the Royal Artillery. Yes, again, I mean, another another regiment. I mean, I, I, I could have pulled out so many, so many collections mm -hmm. um, that, that are interesting to look at. Um, uh, the, the Royal Artillery is, uh, is of course, Ubique is their motto, meaning everywhere. And, you know, there's such a big call. My grandfather served in the Royal Garrison Artillery and was uh, as deaf as a post in later life um, as a result of that. So so they said, so family so family law has it. It could just have been that he was extremely old by the time I, I knew him. But, but uh, yes, he served in the Garrison Artillery. Um, Garrison Artillery, Horse Artillery, uh, field, Royal Field Artillery. Another one, I'm going to sneak this one in, Ellie. Um, on. On, Honourable Artillery Company, a separate uh, license for us as well, different regiment. Um, but again, all unique to, to find my past. And with the Royal Artillery records, we publish, uh, again, enlistment registers, 
pre-First World War, uh, and then right through to the Second World War as well. So even though records, for the most part, have not been released uh, for Second World War, you will find reference to uh, Second World War Royal Artillerymen on Find My Past. And as you say, you know, my grandfather was in the Royal Artillery, he was a gunner, but Second World War, not First World War. Yes. Um, what I thought would be quite good now is obviously we've we've had your your insight is, into your I say favourite record sets. I suppose it's like picking a favourite child. I don't know if you even could. Um, let's just do a very very quick brief look at just some of the other records that are available on Fire Pass uh, for researching military ancestors. Um, I don't know if there's any particular ones on this list. So be for before. The First World War, in essence. Um, are there any that you would like to draw out and talk about a little bit at all? Well, I think um, the Anglo-Boer Boer War records are good. Um, that's that's a partnership with Myrig Jones, uh, who's, who's a friend, um, but he also has the the Casus Belli website, um, which is which is a Boer War interest website, and he's he's interested. He's, he's a I think he was born in South Africa or, or Zimbabwe, uh, but he's born on the Af African continent anyway. But he's had an interest in the Boer War for many years, and and we licensed the the Boer War Anglo Boer War records from him, and that's a continuing, uh, continually growing data set. Actually, he's uh, he goes through the medal rolls, and uh, and pu we publish the information from those medal rolls, which which are vastly edited by Myrig. So that, so they are very um, they're very detailed records, and um, you know before. Everyone knows about the First World War and people being um, the, the Army Reserve being called out, men being mobilised, etc., and volunteers going to fight, you know, territorials volunteering to, to fight overseas, the PALS battalions, etc. Um, this was all foreshadowed by the Boer War, which which called saw, saw the reserves being called out, saw a proclamation being issued in October 1899, saw men volunteering. Um, the, the precursor of the territorial force was the volunteer force, and you had volunteer force men who volunteered to join. They had to uh, be discharged from the volunteer force and then re-enlist, and they, they went overseas in special special volunteer service companies. So so that's that's interesting. Um, as, and as I say, it did rather foreshadow what, what would come um, uh, 14, 15 years later when the First World War started. So so definitely interesting if you've got a Boer War interest. Some of these others um, we've covered in the regimental records, so discharge lists, um, um, must, muster rolls. Yeah, muster rolls are important. We, uh, You'll find, again, many of those at National Archives, um, not necessarily on Find My Past, but, but they are important um, because if a service record does not exist for men who served in the 1800s, you may find them on muster rolls at the National Archives. And in fact, um, I do have to go to the National Archives to to go through some muster rolls for somebody. Um, I, I said I'd do so. So I'm uh, so I'll be, I'll be doing that. The, the, the muster rolls were compiled in uh, quarterly and then bound into annual volumes, and you and you can go through and find your ancestor. Thankfully, most of the muster rolls, all the ones I've seen, have, have been compiled in alphabetical order. So it's fairly easy to go and find your ancestor in there, but it does, but it is a time time consuming process to do so. Absolutely, so, for anything that isn't digitised, I suppose it is. It's quite time consuming. It is. It sort of reminds you how it was before Find My Past, actually, or before before records came online. I mean, everybody. Um, I mean, you're too young to to have had to go through that, Ellie, to be honest. But I, but I, I well remember going to National Archives, looking through, having to go up to the desk, order a microfiche. Um, and then go and take it back to the microfiche scanner and look for a metal index card on the microfiche. And, and the same with film, you know, reeling the film round and round. And, it, you know, I, I spent so many of my holidays in those days when I was working, you know, my, my annual leave at National Archives going through records. But these days it's just so easy, just just a click of a mouse. So, um, yeah, you don't know you were born. <laughs> um, now, we've touched on a lot of the First World War stuff already, but is there anything on this list that you would like to pull out and talk about a little bit more? Well, I think uh, the Red Cross records are, are great. Um, there, there's records which we publish um, in partnership with Naval and Military Press. Um, these are uh, a Red Cross and Order of St John lists which were published. So these are these are men men who were missing in action, and you'll find list the list of the men. You'll find inquiries uh, next to those men as well. Um, so so somebody inquiring about somebody I you know, last last heard of at, at Mons. Um, alleged to have 
uh, been taken to a hospital, haven't heard anything since. You'll find all sorts of comments like that. Um, so that's that's important. And of a similar ilk, uh, in some respects, are the prisoner of war records, because those records which we've published, um, which are, again, they're held by the International Committee of the Red Cross, as opposed to the British Red Cross, which were the ones I was just talking about a minute ago. So these, these ICRC records are, again, they comprise lists of men who are held in camps who have an index card that then points to the, the, the lists of the men in camps. And then you'll have another uh, index card, which is an inquiry from, a, from an ancestor. So for instance, if you go to to look for John Kipling of the Irish Guards, you'll you'll find an inquiry, uh, several inquiry cards that came from his mother. Um, and his father was, of course, Rudyard Kipling, uh, the, the poet and, uh, and author. So, so you find inquiry cards and you, and you find, for those men who were captured, um, cards for them in camps as well. So we've transcribed all that. Gosh. Brief look at the Second World War. And I think one of the things to point out with Second World War service records is, am I right in saying that for after 1921, you need to go to the MOD? Am I correct? You're absolutely spot on, Ellie. Yeah, you've been doing your homework, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. Um, so there's uh, the MOD is currently uh, experiencing a 12 month waiting list, apparently. So if you, wow. it's, yeah, I know it's a it's a two part process. So so the good news is that you can order records. Um, if you're an, even if you're if you're not an ancestor, then it has to be um, if you're not a descendant, rather. Um, it, the person has to have been dead for at least 125 years. Oh, excuse me, I'm just going to turn my phone off. No worries. Uh, right, sorry about that. Um, and um, yeah, so so there is, it's a process actually, it's a form filling process. And uh, you have to fill in a form about yourself and then form about obviously the person you're looking for, send it off to the MOD with a check for £30 and then as I say, it, it could be a, a year before the records are uh, come back to you. But but the MOD will get back to you in due course. They'll photograph the um, the, the records for you and send them back. But they'll only they'll only send you what they want you to see. So if there are if there are medical inf medical forms uh, details about next of kin, those documents either won't be photographed or they'll be redacted. I mean that's fair enough. But I didn't know that. That's good because mm. I think my. I think my aunt has requested my grandfather's because we've never seen them, but she did this last year. And I'm sure lots of people got very interested in family history last year. Um, so, yes, I'm not surprised that there's a, a huge wait and they're doing fantastic work getting the records out to people. Um, are there any on here on this list that you'd like to tease out at all? We've talked about the prison of war records already, for example. Well, I think... Um... Uh, the the again, when we did the, the prisoners of war, we talked about prisoners of war for the ICRC. Uh, that's the First World War, but we got lots of prisoners of war for the for the Second, Second World War as well, uh, in partnership with the National Archives, Commonwealth War Graves Commission. Of course, is always uh, important. So you what you will find in amongst our collections, um, you've got the Royal Engineers. Uh, up to 1945, you've got casualties for, for for the Royal Engineers. You've got men transferring into the Royal Engineers. So these do cover the Second World War period, um, but at the moment they're all uh, they're, they're not the service records. So you're, you're getting you're, you're getting few records uh, here and there. You, you're getting enlistment registers, you're getting casualty lists, names on casualty lists, etc. But it's not the full service records. But but what I would say was um, even even with service records from the First World War, um, they only tell you part of the story. They'll they'll tell you um, when a man joined up. Um, when he was promoted, uh, if he was wounded, if he attended courses, etc. If you're lucky, you'll you'll find all that, which is which is vital information. But as far as the service in the actual war is concerned, it doesn't tell you where he was. It doesn't tell you where he was fighting. Um, for that information, you need to look at the war diaries, and, and the war diaries are held by the National Archives for the First World War. They're in W95, and at this point in time, you can uh, go to the National Archives website and download the war diary for the for the First World War free of charge. Um, for the Second World War, the diaries are exist as well, which you can access, but they're not online. So again, you'd have to go to the National Archives. But but the important point to note is that if you find your ancestor, you you, you know the regiment he served with, you can then go to the National Archives and find the war diary. And and although it won't mention him by name, unless he's an officer, it's unlikely to mention him by name. You will find 
the diary that tells you on a day-to-day -day basis what that particular unit was doing and where it was where it was stationed so it's that's extremely important so you know as i said 60 percent of first world war service records destroyed but it isn't the end of the world actually because uh, if you know if you know when he enlisted your soldier and you know when he was discharged you can pretty much work out where he must have been by just finding the relevant war diary so so those are really important actually lovely and i just just a brief mentioned that you know we don't just have uh, military records for the britain uh, on final pass we also have some for beyond uh, we've got some for australia and new zealand which are listed here and yeah. we also have some for usa and also canada this isn't all of them this is just a small selection yeah it is i mean we've got um for the, i don't think we've got australia embarkation roles on that list but we but we certainly publish them on Farmer Pass. So these are soldiers who embarked from Australia, the Anzacs, uh, went to Gallipoli. I've just uh, bought some South African medals in the week, actually, from well, talking about Australia. But I bought some South African medals. Um, so yes, it, I mean the Empire. It was it was the British Empire um, responding to the uh, uh, to the call for for men, and so you you do have these men embarking. Um, uh, from Australia, coming across from Australia, from Canada, from South Africa, from India, of course, um, and I, I don't know what exists for India. I don't think uh, I, I'd love to. I'd love to discover an archive of Indian soldiers who served in the First World War. I don't think it exists, but certainly for Australia and Canada and South Africa, there are there are roles of men uh, who served in the certainly in the First World War. Um, um, probably in the second world war as well and uh, unlike the records in this country which were as i say largely destroyed in the second world war uh, the ones from australia and canada are pretty intact um, so you you can find some information on farm pass but you'll find um, a lot more in in terms of um, uh, images if you go to those uh, library and archives canada or the australian war memorial you can download the service records directly from there lovely and just a brief note on context. Um, so I mentioned earlier that Paul's helping me with a, a small research project for a, for a blog post at the moment. And I mentioned to Paul earlier how amazing it would be if I had maybe brushed up on my, my history a little bit better before delving into this research. And this is why I'm, I'm so grateful for, to Paul for, for helping me out with this. But um, it's all very well coming to a website like Farmer Past and searching for your ancestor in military records and finding something. But unless you know how to interpret it, I think that's where the power is. What that column means, what this number means, that's where you really start can you can really start to build that bigger picture. I, I, I don't know if I'm explaining this right, Paul. No, you are. And I mean, you're very kind. I mean, I, I shouldn't take it so much credit. You've done a lot of work before I even jumped in. But but the thing is, Ellie, that, that there's so much um, that's available out there now um, from interest groups, from uh, forums. Uh, there's there's a number of forums that I that I go to. I, I have no shame in doing so. I don't I don't profess to know it all by any means. And there are I wish I knew more, but there are certainly experts out there. I I, I visit a regular, uh, I regularly visit a, a page on Facebook um, called, I think, 19, uh, 1888 to 1914 British Army, or words to that effect anyway. But it's, it's essentially an interest group for the, for the British Army in that period. And there are some extremely knowledgeable people on there who, who can, you can send them a photo and they'll instantly tell you exactly what it is and what the pattern of, of what, what particular uh, service stress uh, that is and they're just very very knowledgeable and you you'll often get an answer back within you know half an hour or several answers so i think i think don't be shy is what i'd say um we don't all you know knowledge is a wonderful thing and everything's easy when you know it when you know the answer but but of course it's it's getting that answer you know and we we don't all know it all so don't be afraid to to jump in and ask what might be a silly question um, and you'll find that most people are, are only too pleased to help so so yes you can learn about regimental numbers and roles but you could also uh, you know I, and I published a blog for that matter on regimental numbers and, and when they were issued um, but you can also um, just go to a, go to a forum um, and ask a question and go to the Facebook page on that find my past has for that matter and ask questions there Someone there's will jump so in. many knowledgeable people in our forum so many 
Um, and of course, um, Paul has been doing all year, has been doing a monthly military session on Farm Pass from Home. Um, and a link to the playlist will be in the video description for this if you want to go and check that out after watching this. Um, and just a brief note on other sources as well. I did, I'd have to mention newspapers, Paul, before we finish up, because I just oh, wanted yeah. to show you some examples of what I've pulled from this, this research that Paul's been helping me with. Um, so the two on the, the one on the left and the one in the center are both connected to the family that I've been researching and it's amazing the detail that you can pull out from these historical newspapers. So the one on the left tells me that a relative of mine, she's not a direct ancestor, she is a relative. Um, she at one point had five sons fighting during the First World War in active service. And what it just it goes into detail here about what fact that one of them has since died and another one has been wounded for a second time and fears losing his left hand. I mean, where where else are you going to find that sort of information in one in one record? The center one is a photograph, which was really special to find. Again, this this isn't a, a direct ancestor of mine, but he is a relative. Everybody with the name Overthrow is definitely a relative because it's just such an uncommon name. And then the last thing I wanted to draw your attention to everybody is this illustration from the Illustrated Police News. Um, which depicts the Battle of the Somme. And I don't think this small clipping does it justice. So I actually got the whole thing. And you'll have to forgive me here because it's over two pages. So I've snipped it from the two pages, which is why they don't quite match up. But I just think that that's just an illustration, but that's just an example of the kind of thing you can find, even if you're not researching ancestors during the war and you're just interested in, say, the First World War and the history of it in particular, this is the kind of thing that you can come across. Looks awful, doesn't it? Looks terrifying, don't you think? That yes. Illustration. And um, spoiler alert for the blog that I will be publishing, one of the people I researched, um, thankfully, uh, Paul found out that he was probably actually wounded. Um, well, not thankfully that we found this out, but thankfully that you found it, Paul. Um, this person in particular was probably wounded at the Battle of the Somme. So yes. And in terms of where, where do you go next? So I am a firm believer that when you find a record for your ancestor, that is just one part of the puzzle. It's just what, it's one piece of their story. And the same goes for military records. There is more to find. So you can, Paul's already touched on this, but you can go and explore other records. So the censuses, for example, we you can look at historical newspapers and to build that bigger picture but we've also got something really exciting coming in January, haven't we, Paul? What's that, Ellie? Oh, I don't know. It's just this <laughs> massive logo from this PowerPoint. Oh, the 1921 cents. Of course. Oh, yeah. How could I have forgotten that? It's, yeah, I mean, it's tremendously exciting, isn't it? It's, um, well, I remember when the uh, 1911 census came out, and I'm still working through soldiers from the 1911 census, uh, because, of course, the 1911 census enumerated soldiers who were serving overseas. Um, so you have soldiers in, in Britain who are, of course, included on the census. And then you've got soldiers um, so soldiers overseas and soldiers in Ireland. Uh, there was a separate census taken uh, by the Irish government. But for 1921, uh, those soldiers serving in Ireland, you will find them on the 1921 census and you'll find them uh, overseas as well. So, yeah, fantastic. Not not just soldiers, Navy as well, and people, people at sea. So uh, yeah, that's just one small attractive element hugely attractive element to me for the 1921 census it's going to keep me busy for the next decade actually Ellie, and, and beyond looking at looking at soldiers and also of course looking not just at the men who are in the army but looking at those men who had come out of the army um, just a few years earlier and were back in civilian life what what are they saying about themselves and their lives i know that one of my men i researched charles Saberon, his name is uh so for these salaries by the time he got to the 19 1939 register he was writing on their disabled ex-serviceman he lost his leg uh, at mons in 1914 disabled ex-serviceman and he wrote his uh, regimental number and his regiment down on the 1939 register so what's he going to be writing on the 1921 census and what are other men going to be writing men who were blinded who were disabled what are the widows going to be writing so the yeah, extremely uh important to, to see how those men and those families were coping um what their lives were like 
just such, such a few short years after that uh, dreadful war. So yeah, extremely exciting, uh, Ellie. It's going to it's going to open a lot of doors for a lot of people, and not just for individual family research, but also what England and Wales was like after the war, after a pandemic. It, it, yeah, it's it's going to shed a lot of light, basically. Um, Thank you so much for joining us today, everybody. Please do add any um, comments or questions you have into the comments and we will, as this is pre-recorded, we will get back to you as soon as we can. Paul, thank you so much for joining me today. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. Um, and remember, as I said, Paul does a monthly military session here on Find My Past From Home, the playlist of which is in the video description link for you. And look out for the next one. Paul's going to be doing another one in November. So, yes, fantastic. Um, keep researching. Keep sharing your stories with us. And uh, we will catch you next time. Thank you.